Earth is considered by many in the Alpha Quadrant to be the capital of the United Federation of Planets. It's the location for both the Federation Council and Starfleet Headquarters, as well as the main Academy facility. Because of this, the direction of the UFP has always been closely tied to the development of humanity, ever since its formation in 2161. But what's often overlooked is the influence that Vulcan has had on the organisations over time. As the first species encountered by mankind, after humanity attained warp travel, the Vulcans have had as much time in the development of Starfleet in the UFP as humans, and many of these influences remain in later eras of Trek. Hi, Rick here, and I'm putting together a short series of analysis videos based on the lore surrounding early Starfleet leading up to the founding of the Federation. These are going to be rather short ones focused on particular topics, beginning with the influence Vulcan had on early Starfleet. The Warp Program originated with Zephram Cochran, and continued to evolve through the exploits and experiments of people like Dr. Henry Archer. Throughout the 2140s, the Vulcans observed these experiments, but preached caution and restraint to the chagrin of many. There was a general belief among many Vulcans that humans were too impulsive and irresponsible for their rate of development, and the United Earth generally accepted the advice of their Vulcan neighbours. After all, humanity, by the time of the Warp 5 program, had yet to really explore beyond the nearby systems, except for travel along already established trade routes, and some mixed success colonisation efforts. In contrast, the Vulcans had been a spacefaring civilization for the last 350 years or so, and already had vessels capable of easily reaching Warp 7. To give further comparison for humanity's perceived recklessness, it took Starfleet around 40 years to make it from Warp 1 to 2, while the Vulcans took over 100 years. Cargo ships were soon running Warp 2 engines, while Starfleet booted up the Warp 5 program only a decade or two later, in 2119. Warp 3 was then achieved in 2144, and the NX-01 launched in 2151. The Vulcans, despite this, occasionally offered guidance in the development of humanity's technology, but were very careful never to simply give away their tech. As a result, Starfleet developed a different standardised warp profile for its vessels based on the more common twin nacelle design, as opposed to the Vulcans' preferred warp ring. The reason for the careful nature of the Vulcans was due to their non-interference policy. This law prevented them from interfering in the local affairs of others and causing potentially unforeseen consequences. For example, in 2053, World War III was winding down on Earth, and the Vulcans observed, but stayed clear. Imagine their surprise when only a decade later, the Taplana Hath scout ship detected a warp signature in the Sol system. <laughs> Actually considering this, it adds even more to the Vulcans' distrust of humans. As far as they were concerned, humanity had just been nuking each other a few years ago, and now they were space-born. Great. Anyway, as humanity began to find its way further and further out, it needed to rely on the Vulcans occasionally, although Captain Archer of the Enterprise was wary of leaning too heavily on Vulcan support as a matter of pride and principle. Saying that, the NX-01 did have a copy of the Vulcan exploratory database in its computer core, although it was overseen by the High Command Liaison, Subcommander T'Pol. So much of its early data was useful in encounters with other species, and the Enterprise would frequently visit locations that had already been catalogued by the Vulcans, simply because humans hadn't been there yet. They were even able to add some of missed data for their allies. The most common resource that the Enterprise relied on were a set of Vulcan navigational star charts, which catalogued vast areas of space. Because of this heavy reliance on Vulcan data, several pieces of terminology carried over into the Starfleet vernacular, such as the planetary classification system. In Star Trek, an M-class world is an acceptably habitable world for human life, and the M comes from the Vulcan word Minshara. Minshara was another name for Vulcan, according to some sources, so saying a planet was Minshara class was effectively saying it was Earth-like. 
It wasn't long before early Starfleet explorers realised the need and wisdom behind adopting a level of non-interference to both curtail potential abuse of less advanced civilizations and protect from unintended contamination, cultural or literal. As a result, Starfleet soon began figuring out some rough guidelines based on the Vulcan's own non-interference policy. With the founding of the Federation in 2161, this directive was finalised and written into Federation law alongside the operational versions in Starfleet as subsets of the Prime Directive. As with the Vulcan policy, technological level would be a guiding factor in the meeting of a new species. The Vulcans had long decided that they should remain away from other worlds unless they developed faster than light travel. A very logical approach observe a species and let them evolve naturally until it's inevitable that they'll begin to meet alien cultures. This is what guided the Vulcans' first contact with humanity, and it was one Starfleet would mirror. There are some differences though. For example, exceptions are made for the detection of other forms of advanced technology. According to apocryphal content, the Trill, for example, developed subspace radio before warp, and therefore were aware of and in communication with other cultures before they became an interstellar power. Also, other species such as the Klingons did not have such laws and often raided primitive worlds, so again in these cases the Prime Directive was a little more flexible. This relationship with the Vulcans was a two-sided affair though, as humanity was instrumental in the return of the Kishara, which led to the Vulcan Reformation in 2154, one of the many elements which led to the Earth-Romulan War. Unbeknownst to both the Vulcan High Command and Starfleet, however, the High Command had been under the sway of Romulan operatives for quite some time, which in no small part accounted for some of the Vulcans' cynical and suspicious behaviour towards other powers, including, to a limited extent, humanity. Even before this, however, humanity had been doing its best to mediate the tensions between Vulcan and Andoria two neighbouring powers that had been engaged in a territorial dispute for a century. By bringing these local powers to the negotiating table, Earth was rapidly shaking things up and making quite the entrance to the interstellar stage, but that will be a plot thread picked up in the next video. Over the next two centuries, the Vulcans, alongside humans, would become one of the most prolific species in Starfleet's ranks, eventually going all in with this Federation alliance. As with all Federation worlds, they maintained their own organisations, but even these enjoyed great levels of influence among the others, with even entire Starfleet vessels dedicated to all Vulcan crews. Suffice to say, like many of Starfleet's early relations, the Vulcans began on rocky terms with humans, but soon became one of, if not the staunchest of allies. In current era Starfleet, the Vulcans have spent decades contributing vastly in the avenues of science, philosophy, medicine, and their educational institutes are considered some of the best around. Almost every Starfleet ship has several Vulcans serving on it, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with the ease of applying the prosthetics. Thanks for watching the first part in this series of early Star Trek lore, and I'm hoping to be able to produce a lot of these smaller elements so I have something to release while things are hectic here, so if you have a topic you'd like to see addressed around early Starfleet in detail, let me know. Next up, I'll be looking into the Romulans' influence, but until then, thanks for watching. I've been Rick, Diftorhi Smusma. <laughs>